These incidences occurred in the Rocky Mountains, just south of Silver Plume, Colorado, beginning in the evening of August 14th, 2018, and more strange occurrences would take place the following couple of nights too. So, that day, a couple of neighbors had gone hiking along the ridgeline of Leavenworth Mountain, just south of town, and I was set to meet them up there later that afternoon. My plan was to rendezvous with them in the early evening and hang out until after the sun went down. That night was the peak of the Persuade meteor shower and it was forecast to be especially spectacular since the moon would be a barely thin crescent and would not obscure the clear dark skies. So I set out in the following hours with a small pack and limited supplies since I was staying relatively close to home anyway. I did have a small camelback with a liter or two of water a rock hammer and hatchet, my new green laser that I was hoping would add another bit of good times to the night's light show, but I started the hike a bit later than I'd planned. The main trails to the top consisted of a series of long and winding switchbacks, so I decided to cut some time by bushwhacking straight up the mountain to meet my friends. But my plan backfired as I found myself slowed down by the steeper than anticipated inclines, slippery rock tailings and sheer cliffs. Unfortunately, the cell service is spotty at best, and I was unable to contact my friends until finally reaching the summit around sunset. After a few attempts, I finally got connected to my pals via text, and to my surprise, learned that they had already hiked back down into town as it was starting to get dark. I told them no problem, since I had planned to stay up top of the mountain until late anyway to count meteors, and maybe they could join later. They informed me that they were pretty beat from the day's trek, but would let me know after they'd rested a bit and had some dinner if they thought that they would make it back out. And the new arrangement was perfectly fine by me. Being the consummate night owl and having lived in this area for like five plus years, most of my excursions into the mountains tended to be nocturnal and I'd spent many at night, some planned, some not, getting along just fine in these precarious mountains and usually had very little anxieties in doing so. In this manner, I made my way down the ridgeline of Leavenworth to a locally known camping area, Pavilion Point, which from its high vantage point overlooked both Silver Plume and the neighboring town of Georgetown. In between the two small towns, approximately two or three miles apart, was an old railroad attraction called the Georgetown Loop. I should also mention now that at this time, there was a strict fire ban in effect and that this summer was probably the driest that I'd experienced since moving to Colorado back in 2013. There was also several wildfires wreaking havoc in the state requiring all available emergency resources. The failing to adhere to the fire ban was taken very seriously with fines ranging into the thousands of dollars. That being said, I had not planned on having a campfire for the obvious reasons. After settling into a comfortable spot near Pavilion Point though, I kicked back and started counting the fireballs. By 9 or 10 p.m., my friend let me know that they wouldn't be making it back up the mountain and to enjoy the show and that maybe he would join me the following night. After the next hour or two, I had counted close to 100 meteors, ranging from quick zips to bright fireballs that would leave these awesome streaks that temporarily froze the sky like thin glow sticks that slowly faded into the darkness behind. Quite honestly, I was having a blast, and as the novelty was finally starting to wear off, I began to hear some faint noises and rustling about in the darkness of the surrounding woods. I wasn't worried much yet, and was used to hearing all kinds of strange sounds in the woods, and knew that it was probably nothing more than some deer or porcupine or something like that at worst. But after a few minutes, and as the rustling seemed to be moving closer, paranoia sort of got a hold of me, and... I decided to take some action. Typically during similar late night adventures, I would just build a small campfire to scare away any critters and add some comforting proximity lights to the area. But as previously stated, fires, no matter how well contained, were strictly prohibited. Besides the fact that I could possibly be sighted and fined, I was actually more worried about actually causing a wildfire, which I would never be able to forgive myself if I was somehow responsible for destroying the surrounding woods which I had now considered home. And it was at this point that I remembered that in my backpack I had that powerful green laser that I'd brought along. I wrestled around the pack in the dark for a few moments and I kicked myself for not remembering that I'd brought it, thinking how maybe it could scare off animals. 
but glad to have found it finally, in hand, I started aiming into the dark woods and bushes where I had heard the noises. I felt more at ease for a moment until the laser hit the eyes of some sort of forest creature in some nearby bushes. The eyes, reflecting the laser like what you'd see a late night dark highway, the deer in the headlights effect sort of thing, but whatever it was, likely a fox, hopped, screeched and disappeared into the darkness. I also had with me a small dim headlamp which remained off the entirety of the night to help keep my natural night vision. I quickly shined it around but it was pretty much useless in illuminating anything further than like a dozen or so feet. A bit startled at this point but not wanting to head down the mountain just yet, I decided to go against reason and proceeded to build a tiny fire pit using the stones around me until I had a foot and a half circular pit constructed with a large flat rock to cover the top that I figured would definitely contain all burning embers and hopefully any light that might be looking to escape. I also stationed my camelback next to it to douse the flames if need be. It's still probably the smallest campfire that I'd ever made. The smoldering twig pile, literally the size of my hand, it still immediately put me at ease. But that feeling was unfortunately short-lived and after a few minutes... I was feeling guilty about breaking the rules and possibly putting the area in danger with my small fire. But instead of putting it out, I decided that it would be best to have a quick scout around the area to see if I could spot any signs of a possible patrolling forest ranger or nearby campers, even though in my previous five years of hanging around here, I'd never seen a single soul in this area at night. I decided that it couldn't hurt though, so... I made my way over to the scenic overlook which loomed a thousand feet or more directly over the Georgetown Loop Railroad area with Silver Plume dimly illuminated to the west and Georgetown to the east. I scanned the surrounding woods looking for any signs of life and saw nothing unusual. As my fears of breaking the law or of sparking a natural disaster subsided, I eased back and continued dinking around with the laser, wielding it like a lightsaber and tracing the lines of meteors that were still zipping overhead. As midnight approached, I guessed that I had had my fill of shooting stars for one night and I decided to take one last look around for fire snitches. As I went over and peered down towards the railroad near the base of the mountain, I noticed what looked like a singular light pop on which quickly turned into two lights which, to my stunned dismay, appeared to be heading up in my direction. I was immediately taken aback by the sight of any lights in that area, being that the railroad was closed and didn't allow camping on the premises. The two lights appeared impossibly to be moving straight up the mountain directly towards me. The preceding incline between myself and the railroad was luckily made up of dense forest with steep jagged cliffs and without a doubt had no roads or trails that would lead straight up the mountain. My initial thought when the lights appeared was that it must be forest rangers on ATVs or dirt bikes or something and they somehow miraculously detected my small fire, perhaps with trail cameras, thermal optics or maybe some night vision. I was baffled that there were two separate lights as I had knowledge that we only had one forest service employee that oversaw this entire geological quadrangle and it was highly unlikely, rather inconceivable really, that... They would be on any kind of watch or patrol that night, much less two of them. Regardless, I stared down in amazement for a moment, quickly calculating that, even with fast dirt bikes on some unknown secret trail, I'd probably had the jump on them by at least five or ten minutes. I turned, urgently gathering my things and dumped the rest of my water on any remaining embers just in case the fire was what they were after and proceeded to scurry in the opposite direction on the main trail that led me back towards Silver Plume. I figured that even at a brisk walk I would be so far out ahead of any pursuers that I didn't worry too much and made my way without any flashlight or headlamp as to not draw any further unwanted attention. Was there really anybody headed up the mountain to look for me anyways? It seemed completely improbable and I was probably just overreacting to the movement of some odd lights or something so I was telling myself anyway. After a couple of minutes, I made it maybe 200 yards down the trail and quickly glanced back to the pavilion point, and to my complete and utter horror, I could see what looked like a couple of bright flashlights darting around from left to right, frantically searching around the same area that I had built my fire pit. I could hardly believe my eyes, and 
don't know what it was, but a deep sense of dread just flooded over me. Although thoroughly confused now, I suppose that my fire must have been spotted and I was likely in a lot of trouble. In this moment, I still believe that the lights had to be some type of forest ranger or law enforcement cracking down hard the imposed fire ban. Realizing now that if caught, I would probably receive a misdemeanor citation and be fined upwards of $2,000, I began to run. As I got into a full sprint, I reached over my shoulders and grabbed both rock hammer and hatchet off my pack that had started clanking together loudly. The headlamp around my neck I would click on and off for only a second at a time every dozen paces or so. But like I mentioned at the start, it was very, very dark and there were many twists and turns along this trail. With that in mind, I realized that taking the switchbacks would not be an ideal way of getting down this mountain and so started darting down some smaller offshoot deer trails that, though tighter and more treacherous, would ultimately get me down quicker. As I turned and jetted down one of these more concealed byways, I could see one of those lights which had a hint of sort of purplish fluorescent hue and looked kind of like a motorcycle headlight was headed right down the main trail in my direction. I could also see that the second light had picked a different trajectory towards me from Pavilion Point, making a beeline that, to my bewilderment, shot it up over the tree line straight in my direction. At this point, my mind felt like it had exploded. I mean, there was just now no possible explanation for the situation that I now found myself in. Things were just not adding up in any logical way, not even close. First, the improbability that my fire could have been traced or seen was nearly zero. Second, two rangers or law enforcement in that area willing to give pursuit, also nearly zero. Third, the fact that those lights could traverse that dense and steep mountain face within mere minutes, that for sure was impossible. And now, one of the lights had taken flight, literally defying gravity in front of my eyes as it effortlessly glided over the thick wooded pines that covered the entire area. My mind was completely blown. All of a sudden, this was no longer about getting a ticket or being fined or receiving a stern scolding about forest safety and whatnot. No, this was... This was... I didn't even have time to think about it. My legs never stopped moving as I squinted my eyes trying to see my way down this forsaken mountain. I clicked the headlamp on and off, never slowing down, on and off another dozen times, on and off, and that was when I felt it. Within a split second, all of a sudden, I am completely weightless. Silence. What's happening? Did I die? Had I been shot or something? But I didn't hear any gunshots. And then, just whack, and my legs hit hard wood and broke through thick tree branches. I relaxed my hands and the hatchet and the rock hammer were gone. Sharp pain and I immediately thought my legs were broken. I was spinning, but no tumbling. One last crash as I landed on my back against what felt like solid rock. Another lightning bolt of pain and this time, my tailbone as my back end flattened against the rock pile. I felt completely broken. My legs felt broken. I didn't know what had just happened. Blinding pain now all over my body and as I lay my head back for a second to get my bearings, I see overhead behind me up about 20 or 30 feet on what must have been the trail that I was just on, zoomed that purplish white light as it continued down the small deer trail towards town. Half a second later, out in front of me and slightly downhill zoomed the second light, now below the tree line on the adjacent main trail running parallel to the one that had disappeared beneath my feet. I lay for a second wondering if I was dead, then wondering how many bones I had broken, and feeling around my body for a moment with bloodied wet hands, slowly realized that I had just run straight off a cliff face hit a huge pine on the way down that flipped me into a cartwheel twice before smashing my butt straight first into a slightly exposed rock pile. And I was almost there having made it about three-fourths the way down the mountain. I tried to move again, but pain made me almost cry out in agony. 
I slid myself slightly to the right off of some of the bigger boulders that I had landed on, onto a softer spot of ground. But before I could even think for a second though, I saw both lights headed back down the main trail that was located about 30 feet in front of me. I gasped and then held my breath as both the lights approached, hearing what sounded like fate garbled walkie-talkie radio chatter. I quickly reached into my pocket and switched my phone off so it wouldn't make a sound or ping my location. As the lights got closer and passed in front of me, I could finally see what the heck it was that had had me in a pursuit for the last 10 minutes. Side note too, the typical hike down from Pavilion Point into Silver Plume took at least 30 to 40 minutes and I had almost made it down with probably a quarter mile or so before I would have stepped back into the lights of civilization. But no, now I'm stuck on an angled rock slope, bleeding all over, not sure the extent of my injuries. As I stare out in front of me at the returning chasers, I can see humanoid figures riding on what I can only describe as like futuristic motorcycles. Well, kind of, but where are the wheels? Why is their movement so smooth and steady? Also, why aren't these machines making any noise? The motorcycles and dirt bikes are loud, annoyingly loud in fact, but these seem to make no sound. Have I gone deaf? Did I lose my hearing in the crash? No. Wait. Did I lose my mind in the smash-up? What the heck is going on? At this moment, I'm not even sure if I'm even still alive at this point. And are these postmodern demons hovering around to take me onto the next place? I can't make any sense of it. I can't believe what I'm seeing. No. They're not demons. Yeah. Aliens. That has to be it. Well, maybe. Anyways, the hover bikes, which I'll now refer to them as, passed me by, seemingly unawares of my banged up presence. It seemed as though their riders had at least abandoned their vehement searching for me. They moved slowly and gracefully now, gliding so seamlessly and smooth versus the frantic and accelerated pace of our prior meal. I squinted into the darkness to try and make out these riders, but it was blurry vision. From what I could make out though, they appeared to be wearing what looked like all white or greyish attire, head to toe pretty much. I hear more faint radio garble, but can't make out the sounds. Is it English? Foreign? Or is it even a language? I don't know, but I exhale my held breath, which I'd been holding for who knows how long at this point. Breathe, just breathe. Try and calm down for a second. A few moments pass, I think. I don't know how long as I just laid there trying to breathe, in and out. But what the heck just happened? But what are those things? Who are those people? Before I have any longer to ponder the matter though, I see in the trees more hovering dim lights coming back my way. Oh man, a few seconds later, I see those two hover bikes, now without any headlights on, hovering through the forest on the trail below me. A little further away, I see two more, then three more further in the distance. But most of the hover bikes passed quietly and just kept going westward, disappearing through the woods. I'm not sure how many I counted, to be honest. Maybe ten, maybe twelve? I felt like my mind was completely broken. This cannot be happening. But then, just off the trail in front of me, two of the bikes stopped, and the riders, they jumped off. I can see the dim shape of their outlines against the dark forest. It appears to me now that they're wearing what looks like chemical hazmat suits? Like something out of the movie Outbreak or Arrival? Like big full round face suits or something. But they don't have any flashlights or anything, and it doesn't appear like they're still looking for me at all. They stand next to their hover bikes as the craft start moving very slowly. Their occupants are walking alongside them. Across the side of the bikes, I can see very dim lights slowly flashing across from one end to the other, going from reddish to orangish to yellowish. Very dim, soft lights. The lights are moving from left to right. The bikes hover for a moment and then they stop. The riders now grab what appears to be starves of some sort. Well, some kind of a tool from the opposite side of their bikes. 
They both take a few steps from the hover bikes, bend over and start stabbing at the ground. No. Wait. They seem to be digging. It looks a lot like they're digging. What the heck is going on? I keep watching, squinting my eyes, trying not to breathe, too afraid to make a sound, staying completely still even though my body, especially my butt, is screaming in pain, but I refuse to move, not even a muscle. After digging for a few seconds, these beings return to the bikes and what looks like to be a small round compartment running alongside the bikes, think sort of saddlebags but flush and internal, opens up and the contents of their shovels are whisked inside these compartments. I'm just stunned at this point, totally overwhelmed and engulfed in fear, agony, dread, you name it. I don't even know what I'm looking at to be honest. Are these people? Like human people? Are they aliens? Are they scientists? I really can't tell with those weird suits that they've got on. I watch them work, repeating the cycle, taking samples, insert samples into the craft, move along a few feet, take more samples, etc. These hover bikes can even zero point turn, spinning around like 180 degrees from time to time. I hear no noise during all of this, no talking, nothing, not even forest sounds. And it was at this point that I'm beginning to think to myself that I must have had some sort of psychotic episode with involuntary hallucinations, fear and paranoia. But maybe this is a dream? It doesn't feel like a dream. It doesn't feel like a hallucination either. At least, not from any drug I've tried. But those types of hallucinations have definable characteristics like silver linings, waves, melting, and can be shook off with ease most times. But what's happening right now is none of these things. Maybe this is something new? My mind starts reeling and... I'm thinking, am I crazy? Am I not crazy? Is this real? What is real? What the heck is happening? I can't make sense of any of it. I just sit and watch these things, these beings, these people, or whatever their bikes or hovergrafts or ships or who knows for quite some time. And all of it is just torture. I tell myself to stand up that they can't be real. They aren't even there. You must be crazy. They can't even see you. They won't see you. They're not real. All these thoughts plus a million others are racing through my brain. It all seems so clear though. As I ponder my predicament, I stare up at the sky and I ask why. Why is this happening to me? And as I look, I see a drone pass over. A recognizable drone, like made by humans. I think I can even hear it. It has lights that blink, red, green, red, green, and it passes overhead and out of view. Maybe I'm not crazy. I recognized a drone, and if I was crazy, things would be getting crazier, right? At this point, during all of this time, one of the suits got within like 15 to 20 feet of me before moving on. Didn't they see me? I thought for a few minutes that one of these people were actually staring right at me, in fact. Hard to tell with a devoid masked chemical suit, but still, it looked like it was looking right at me for what felt like forever. Then they just moved on, digging, grabbing leaves off trees and stuff like that. I sat perfectly still just watching these things do whatever they were doing for quite some time. And then finally, dawn rose. And I still sat. I had made it this long, I could make it a few more minutes longer I suppose. But eventually, when dawn came and went, and the sun began to rise into the sky, so did I. When I finally stood up on rubbery limbs, I could barely keep my balance. I looked down to see both legs of my pants were completely stained in blood below my knees. I didn't care though, I felt around to my tailbone, which now had a golf-sized knot that ate with such ferocity. But again, I didn't care. As I looked around, I could finally see what had transpired just hours previous. I found my tossed rock hammer and hatchet close by, laughing about the thought that if I had held on to them, well, what could have happened? Finally though, I slowly and gingerly climbed back up to the short, cut deer trail that I had run off of, 
saw the tree that I had clipped, missing huge broken branches at knee level. I looked around the area where I had landed at large shaped protruding boulders and other broken branches with points that would have impaled me if I hadn't landed on the rocks exactly where I did. And honestly, I should be dead. I gathered my things and started limping home with my mind still confused and reeling about what I'd just seen, but still alive, no doubt. And to be quite honest, I have never felt better to be climbing the stairs to my apartment than that day. I beelined straight for my bed, about to pass out from exhaustion when I realized that I had an appointment in like two and a half hours to get my hair cut. And well, at least I can power nap for like an hour before trying to explain to my hair lady why I can't even sit in her chair anymore. And that was just the beginning of many things that unfolded over the next couple of days here in the Colorado Rockies surrounding Silver Plume. When I was 16, I would nanny for two boys, Brandon who was 8 and Randy who was 15. Now, Randy had mental health problems because he was born with liquid in his brain or something like that. Either way though, he really was a sweetheart, but you could tell that something was off by the way that he walked and moved his hands. They also had a dog, Gunner, that was an Akita and Yellow Lab mixed. This dog was huge and very protective. I watched the kids every other week, all day Monday and Friday. A gunner watched everything that I did the first week. I had to gain this dog's trust. That first week the dog made me uneasy because if I was with the kids and they'd start being loud and rambunctious, he would get between me and the boys and start growling. This happened even if I wasn't playing with them and happened to be near them. Gunner learned to trust me pretty quickly though and there were two times that Gunner actually saved our lives. So, the boys lived in a pretty rough neighborhood. Not scary or anything, but just rough around the edges. We went for a walk to the playground a couple of blocks away, and a white van slows down by us. There were a bunch of ghetto guys yelling at us from the windows, saying inappropriate things to me, the female, and calling Randy horrible names about his condition. I said, just ignore them guys, in a sort of hushed voice as I shifted and pulled myself and Gunner between the kids. Gunner, though, didn't take his eyes off the van full of them. The tension pulled the fur on his back straight up, signaling to us that he was in protective mode. As the men kept yelling at us, I pulled my phone out and started dialing 911, but I didn't hit send before Brandon started yelling back, defending his brother. And then, everything happened so quickly. The slider back door to the van opened and the two men jumped out. I remember screaming run at the boys just as Gunner ripped himself free from my grip on his leash and everyone started running except me. The boys sprinted home, the dog sprinted towards the van and I frantically tried dialing 911. Gunner chased the man back into the van nearly grabbing the leg of one of the men and they sped off. Gunner received a lot of treats and praises when we returned home that day, let me tell you. But the second time... This one still really freaks me out. So, uh, I was allowed to have friends stop by since I practically lived there anyway, and the boys liked hanging out with my wholesome teenage friends too. If it was a male though, I would always have to go outside and hug them where Gunner could see and talk to them for a few minutes on the porch. Gunner would sort of assess them. Normally he would let them inside without trouble after that, but there was one friend that he just wouldn't let inside without coaxing. Gunner would never actually bite anyone unless they attacked, just for context, but one day uh, a man came to the door, knocked and said that he had to drop something off for their mum who was supposedly expecting him. We could see through the window that he seemed like a gentleman and was really nice, but as I approached the door, Gunner sort of cut me off. He started barking at the door insanely, his back stood higher than my hips mind you, and at the time I was a pretty small girl. And the dog just sort of forced me back. Gunner literally prevented me from being able to reach the doorknob. He was gentle with me, but still forceful. I yelled back to the guy to leave whatever it was on the porch, but he seemed pretty insistent, saying things like, Can you really not just unlock the door for a minute? Come on, Randy knows me. Etc. 
But in the end, I just had to tell him that I physically couldn't get to the door, so I could call the mum for him if he wanted. But then the man got really weird and was like, No, that's not necessary. I'll just come back another time, okay? And just sort of rushed off. Anyway, the guy had some distinct features, and when I described him to the mum later, she informed me that she had no idea who he was and that she wasn't expecting anything. We never did find out who he was either, and he never did come back. But anyway, I think Gunnar was onto something that day, and I'm sure glad that he was there. Around November of 2019, I was running to a Target or something for some cupcakes decorating supplies before meeting my aunt and cousin for lunch later that day at a relatively nice restaurant. This being the case, I was slightly dressed up, nothing too fancy, but I did look slightly older. It was around 10 in the morning and I was walking to my car from the Target. I parked pretty far back in the parking lot because I hate fighting for parking spaces. When suddenly, a truck quickly pulls into a parking spot a little in front of me, and a man gets out. I was pretty freaked out as he started to walk up to me, and he asks if I'm single and tells me that I'm the most beautiful woman that he's ever seen. I tell him that I'm actually underage and have a boyfriend. I was lying about the boyfriend, to which he replies that he would wait. This dude had to be at least 40 though, and... He then gets back into his truck and backs into a spot at the back of the parking lot of this particular shopping center. I was about halfway to my car at this point, but no way in heck was I going in my car because he was just sort of sitting there watching me. So instead, I walked into a nearby frozen yogurt place. I looked visibly panicked and I quickly grabbed a cup of yogurt and tried to look natural because this guy was looking at me through the windows. I called my best friend who lives in the neighborhood close to the shopping center and he quickly said that he'd be there soon. About 10 to 12 minutes later, my friend came and he picked me up from the yogurt place. When we pulled out of the parking lot, the dude in the truck started to follow us though. We started to drive around as I texted my aunt that I needed to push the lunch back about 30 minutes. My friend and I took a bunch of back roads in the area and drove through some confusing neighborhoods, but eventually we lost the guy. My friend is an absolute hero for this, and he took me back to my car in the parking lot. I was going to run some more small errands before going to lunch, but that obviously didn't happen that day. Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear, and so much more. My parents were legitimately afraid for me, and were initially against the idea. I had to lie to them that we would stay in a hotel near the Cozier National Park, so they would get off my back. Obviously, that's not what we did. But, long story short, we had to like travel from Bacchus to this park, which is around 200 kilometers and two hours by train. We got our immense backpacks, everything that we needed, and we went on our way. Nothing specifically happened in the train except for the fact that the train was overly crowded, with the exception of our train compartment being completely empty. This is extremely rare for Romanian trains, and I got excited thinking that we have that whole compartment to ourselves. As I said, it's a very rare thing to happen, and of course, after 10 or 20 minutes, it became occupied by a man entering our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful German shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats and dogs in particular. I usually find my way around all animals, even those that don't like people. But not this dog. This dog was, I don't know, weird. He looked so round as if he was sort of like a stuffed animal or something. But he would listen to his owners every single command. I was impressed by it, so obviously I started asking the man about his dog since it would be a long and awkward trip to have to complete in silence. The man was exactly like his dog, and except for the commands that he would give to his dog, there was no other contribution to the conversation. He told me the dog's name is Yuchigasul, which in Romanian means the killer. 
it's a very weird name to give a dog because for this particular example we would use the English word as it is, not translate to the word Romanian and name the dog like that. But I just thought, each to their own, right? I asked him why such a scary name though and he bluntly replied, this dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing he likes and is good at. Now, I personally consider that dogs, they tend to grow up to have similar personalities to their owners. And most of the times, I would judge people with dogs on how that animal reacts to the world and to his own. And let me tell you guys that these two did not have a good vibe in return. I brushed everything over, thinking to myself that maybe this guy is just training his dog to hunt in the woods or something. But then I started thinking, which woods are actually legal to hunt in in our country? And while I was thinking about that, the guy, out of nowhere, asks us if we're traveling to the Kozia National Park. But that was surprisingly accurate considering that the only time that we mentioned the place was in the train station long before we found out our seats, and way longer before we even met this guy. Again, I thought that it was nothing though, because in my country, people who happen to go in the same direction will try to make small talk and guess where you're heading. Of course, you can just lie to keep safe your destination, or be honest, I suppose. I took the honesty route, and I'm judging myself for that. My advice? Never be too honest with strangers. Or perhaps even honest at all, after you hear what I have to say. So... But we confirmed that we were going to that place, asked what else to see around and stuff like that, since he started talking about the area and, well, considering we knew nothing about the place, we took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, the animals that we can encounter there, told us about a beautiful monastery right at the bottom of the mountain that we could climb, advised us to visit the low tree shore waterfall and explore the caves behind it and to try out the local restaurant. When this guy started talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed as if he was experiencing some sort of a pleasant memory though. But he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck, squeezing it tight, and the collar made a sort of loud clink sound. And what surprised me was that the dog made no move, no whimper, no twitch, nothing. Just like a stuffed animal. Anyway, we reach our destination, say our goodbyes, the man waves at us and we face against him to go on our way. I turn around back right away because I wanted to ask where exactly that restaurant was and the man and the dog were no longer there. But not just that because his luggage was also gone. I'll admit that that one creeped me out a bit but who cares. We were just too thrilled for our first camping experience. But we started walking with our backpacks on us, 10 kilos each, and reach a tunnel digging into the mountain. It looked amazing, exactly like those horror movie tunnels which, if traveled during the night, would make your hair stand straight. I guess lucky for me, we traveled during the daytime though, so that wasn't a problem. It wasn't a long tunnel by any means. We could see the end, but by the time that we got to the middle of it, we hear a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog crying in desperation for its life. So we stop. My boyfriend looks at me with this, oh no, you're not going to take that dog with us sort of face and tries to convince me to take a different route. We don't. I hear the dog and I go right towards the sound and in the middle of the road I see a chubby puppy. It was crying really hard and laying on the cement looking really hurt. Maybe it had been hit by a car or something. But... I sort of freeze and think to myself that our trip is almost over anyway, so I have to save this dog. We call for him, he looks at us, pointing ears up, gets up and like a doofus starts running desperately to us. He was alone and afraid the poor thing and so we called him Rudolph and now he was our camping buddy. Like one kilometer further we find another puppy though, maybe his sister which we dragged from the nearby river. Someone must have deserted these puppies or something. She's all wet, cold and hungry and of course we take her too. So here we are, 10 kilogram backpacks each, two puppies at my chest, boyfriend with map, trying to find a spot to camp for the first night. We passed by the monastery the man in the train mentioned, but because we had these puppies we couldn't really enter the inside of the building. The priest wouldn't let us, 
So we just walked around the property through the gardens until we reached the base of the mountain that we had to climb. I would also like to mention too that these puppies were tiny little brats because the second that you put them down and forced them to walk on their own, they would slam their butts to the ground and just cry. And it was a real drama, let me tell you. But we walk and walk and walk until we decide to stop because it was getting late and I was beginning to get cold. We found a spot next to a small landmark type of cottage thing in the middle of the woods. We call it Troyanista. It's like a scouting post, but for the church, where they place religious icons or a Bible, stuff like that, inside of it to bring good energy to the area, that is. It belongs to the church, and it wasn't like a, a house, I would guess, but basically just like a roof with four small walls and an opening, not really a door. But you could go in it, hide from the rain and stuff like that. But there was an icon inside and a Bible with pages ripped from it, and curious as I am, I opened the Bible, was really annoyed to see that people would write down their names in it, like couples do on trees. But on one particular page, the words, I will find you, stuck out. It was written in red ink. Again, I thought to myself that it was probably someone who wanted to scare travelers with silly messages. So I put the book back and gave it no second thought. We put up the tent, make the fire, unpack, make food, and we eat. We feed the puppies, which now are cuddled up in our tent, and finally darkness starts to rise all around us. But my boyfriend always keeps the fire up every hour, because when it went off, it felt as if the sounds in the woods were louder and closer to us than in reality, and it got a little bit creepy. But it's around 12 in the morning, but we're all in the tent cuddling to keep warm, and then the puppies wake up and start crying. I get up and unzip the tent and put them out to pee. They do and I get them back in. They cry some more and the smallest one starts shivering. At that time too, I hear grunting from behind our tent. At this point, my boyfriend is up too. He hears it as well. The fire is fading and the moment that he unzips the tent and steps out, the sound disappears into the woods. Now, it did sound a bit like a snake slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground, but with unimaginable speed. So I ask him, was that a snake? And he says, up to this day, that he cannot explain what he saw. He says that it was a sort of slithery figure with feet that made a snort-like sound when the light hit it. The puppies calm back down after this creature runs into the woods, we try to go back to sleep after we reignite the fire. It's 3am this time when we wake up to the puppies being fussy again. The fire is nearly dead again. We clearly have no idea how to put up a sustaining fire, we think to ourselves. My boyfriend gets up to search for firewood and I get out as well. I stare into the darkness and I swear that I hear whispers coming from between the trees. I look up to the sky, consider that it's like three in the morning, and hear birds being very loud and fluttering their wings. Now, I'm no expert on birds by any means, but they usually sleep around this time, right? Well, these ones weren't. They were very active, very vocal, and seemed almost frustrated. I looked at the fire and followed the red sparks popping out of it into the sky and become fascinated with something. The spark, it doesn't seem to die, it just goes on and on and changing color from like red to green and then other colors. This was really out of the ordinary too and it was odd for me because it created a sort of an illusion. Hard to explain but it was something that was just weird about the night. It sort of looked as if the sparks were going into the woods, creating a track for me. Maybe to follow? I kept looking after each spark to see when it would burn out, but none of them did. They would sort of just levitate, turn green, and then flow into the woods. At that moment, I begin to get goosebumps on my skin, obviously, because, I mean, how is this possible, right? The birds become more agitated, the mysterious light pointing us to go deeper into the woods, and all the trees around us seem to have eyes on them now, like I'm being watched. And as I inspect my surroundings, I 
hear movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, like 10 meters away from us. Obviously, I stand my ground, but don't go near it. When suddenly, a dark, bent-over silhouette comes out of it, and half sort of inside the bush and half outside, just stares at us. I call my boyfriend, and we're both thinking, like, what the heck is that? Is it a bear cub? A wolf? A pig? The creature shakes its head the same way that a dog does after a bath, and I hear a distinguishing clink, like a dog collar. At this point, my boyfriend manages to light up the fire really well, which scares this animal to run back into the woods through the bush from which it initially came out of. That calms us down, but definitely not enough for us to close our eyes during the night and go back to sleep. Going back into the tent though, and after a little while, my boyfriend does fall asleep, but I couldn't. The puppies are sound asleep, and I keep the zipper on the tent opened a little, just enough to have my eye peek through it, right at the earlier mentioned bush. Now, I think I must have spent at least a solid hour just staring at this bush, when all of a sudden, I hear a noise coming from that direction, and I immediately wake up my boyfriend, who is now peeking through the hole in complete darkness with me. And what we see next still haunts me to this day. So, from that exact same bush, we see a human head popping out and looking towards our tent. Note that our peeping hole was small enough to not make it look like you were being watched from the inside of the tent. And this head is slowly coming out of the bush. The skin was honestly so white too that we thought at first that maybe it was a ghost. After that, a shoulder, and then another one, a full torso, a leg, and bit by bit, an entire man emerges from the bush, completely naked, lit up by both the moon and our fire. And what he did next was terrifying. He comes so close to our tent and begins to remove branches, rocks, and stuff like that from our fire, basically trying to extinguish it by dismantling it. This is all happening like two or three meters from our tent, mind you. I look at this man with horror because instantly I recognize him. And now the clink that I heard earlier from that animal is explained. It was the same man from the train with his dog too. I don't know if he followed us, I don't know if he just went the same route as us and found us and decided to stalk us, but this guy was there since 12am at least. Because our fire would be dead every 2 or 3 hours and we would be woken up by the sound of branches being cracked, rocks being moved, which we internally explained as animals crossing the land. But it must have been him. After he successfully managed to put out the fire, he slowly crept back into the same bush, submerging into it bit by bit, until only his head would be out. He sort of stared at the tent as well with a really sort of disfigured looking mouth, looking like a moaning ghost almost. Obviously, we didn't go back to sleep after that. We didn't really know what to do, so in the end we just went back out, reignite the fire, light ourselves some torches and stay near the campfire until the first rays of sun came up. I was too afraid to go near that bush obviously and I did not need any answers or any explanations anymore. I just wanted daylight so that we could get the heck out of there and as soon as that happened we did. We packed our stuff and we got out of there as quickly as we could. We had planned a four day camping trip but this was just too much and so we gave up after that first night. It was a risk that we just did not intend to take, and whether or not that guy followed us or it was just a coincidence, it was enough to ruin everything. In conclusion to my story, and some advice to any first campers out there, please never tell your location or even areas remotely close to your destination to strangers. You just can never be too safe in this world with creeps around like that. Always be safe and always be aware of your surroundings and any changes that come to you under the form of sounds, movements, changes of temperature and so on. Always protect yourself. I 
I may have been eight or nine years old. I lived in a nice little middle class neighborhood. One of my best friends, Raven, lived across the street diagonally, one house down, so I often spent evenings at her home after school. Raven's home would always call my mum to let her know that I was leaving and to expect me in the next minute or so. This way mum knew to unlock our front door. Often she stood and watched from the screen door to make sure that I got across okay as well. But it was around this time that I had begun noticing this beat up red car, possibly an old VW or Buick or something, that would pass by almost every night as I ran back across the street. I would always head home just after dark, so maybe around 8.30, any time that I was leaving Raven's house. And it was always rolling just super slow. The speed limit was like 25 miles per hour, and I want to say that this vehicle always passed at maybe half that. But one night, as I was leaving perhaps a bit later than usual, I stepped out of the side door of Raven's house just as the car was about to pass the house completely. It stopped in the road and backed up as I approached the side of the road. The window was rolled down just as the car stopped in front of me. And a little woman with short reddish brown hair and blue framed glasses was smiling sweetly at me. Hi sweetheart, it's a little late for you to be out right now isn't it? She asked me, her voice was low and pleasant. Uh no, mum lets me, I'm just walking home now. I replied stupidly. Oh gosh... How silly of your mother. There's all kinds of bad people out here late at night. But where do you live, sugar? I'll give you a ride. Just then, my mum came bursting out of our front door and screamed, leave her alone, as she began running to me. The, the woman's pleasant demeanor dropped and I heard her mutter a word, possibly the F word, as she slammed her foot on the gas and took off at well over the speed limit. And on top of this, she didn't stop at the nearby stop sign either. She just blasted through it to make her escape. After this, I got a nice lecture that night, but also a lot of tight hugs. My mum was super glad that she chose to look out of the storm door to check on me instead of just letting me wander home that day. I could have been taken for sure, and she told me as much as well. I can't really remember if the police were called or not, but I never interacted with any officers, so I hazard a guess to say no. But... It doesn't end here though. Like most little kids, I really like setting up lemonade stands. Unlike most little kids though, I also enjoyed hand making and baking cakes and brownies and cookies and also selling those at my lemonade stands. And about two weeks after the prior incident I would say, a beautiful sunny Saturday, mum helped me with the baking and helped me make some lemonade and set me up in the front yard with my sign. She had been paranoid since the prior incident though and had hardly let me out of her sight aside from school and the bus. And this was no different. She stayed outside with me all while I sold my little treats to passerbys. Until she had to run to the restroom. It would obviously be a huge pain to take everything down and bring it inside while she went and then to bring it all back out and set it up again. So she figured that I'd be okay for just a few minutes, considering it was the middle of the afternoon and usually predators aren't that stupid. Mum left me alone for several minutes while she went to the bathroom and presumably went to grab a snack as she was gone for 10 or so minutes. And you can probably guess it, but a familiar face walked up about 8 minutes in. She appeared from around some bushes down the street. I didn't see her in the distance walking up. I honestly saw her even stand up from behind some bushes and brush herself off and begin walking towards me. Her clothes were smart though and sophisticated looking, almost like a, a pantsuit. It was a real clash with just how ratty her car had been, but that same placating smile was on her face and her eyes glinted behind the same glasses. Oh, cute. A lemonade stand. Hi again, sweetie. Sorry for bothering you the other night. I didn't realize just how close to home you were. Mum told me not to talk to you. Go away. I said it as meanly as I could muster, but Mum had rightfully made me so frightened of this woman that I'm sure I just sounded like the scared little girl that I was. But come on now, Mary. She spoke my real name, by the way, first and last, and my eyes immediately got big. I'm a friend of your parents. I live just down the street. Remember? Well, we met at the pool this past summer. I definitely had no recollection of her though. If you're their friend, then 
Why did you leave so quick? Mom? I began shouting for my mother, and this made her crouch down in front of my table, eye to eye with me. We don't need to do that. I just want to talk to you. You like to bake, right? I have a really fancy kitchen with a nice baker's oven. All sorts of cool gadgets to make baking cupcakes and stuff like this. Super fun. No. No. Mum? I stood up and I pushed the table into this woman and started running for the front door. This woman then kicked the folding table away and started to chase me until my mum appeared in the doorway. She flung the door open and I barreled into her and the woman stopped running and stood in the yard. What are you doing to my daughter? My mum shouted at her. Oh my goodness, your child is rude. I was just trying to buy a cupcake and she shoved the table into me and ran. And look, now I have lemonade all over my clothes. The woman clearly lied through her teeth. I really don't think she was expecting my mum to come back. That's the lady from that night in the car. I was now trying to get around my mum and even hide behind her. My mum pulled out her cell phone and this time I know that she called the police. The woman immediately ran off back the direction that she came. The cops then appeared at some stage and one took statements while the other one patrolled the neighborhood searching for her. And they actually ended up finding her car parked at the grocery store that was just up the road, about a half a mile at the other end of the neighborhood. They waited a long time as well for her to show up and come and claim it, but she just never did. And they never could find her either. I never did see her again after that though, of which I'm obviously very thankful. In August, me and the lads got together and decided to visit an abandoned World War II barracks that was hit by bombs. I was carrying a knife on me because, well, it comes in very handy from time to time, and this is kind of vital to the story as well. So we explored the exterior in search of an entrance, until we found a smashed in window in the east wing that wasn't hit as bad. The window had been long since smashed in and there was now no glass anywhere. So we climbed in and arrived in a bare concrete room, and immediately I heard something skitter across the floor, presumably a mouse. We walked through the corridors and rooms of the east wing until we came into what we thought was the sick bay, which was in the west wing that was hit badly by bombs. This one room that we go into has rubble around the entrance, and the wooden roof is caved in as well, and there's ash and the walls are blackened and whatnot. At the back of the room there is this sort of blackened and rusty metal desk, and the desk has a drawer in it. I try to open the drawer, but it's sort of rusted shut, so I go to pull out my knife and pry it open, but when I do, it isn't there. I assume that I must have dropped it on the way in or something, and that I would have to find it on the way out, so I use a rotting plank of wood instead and try and pry it open. But when I finally do get it open, I receive probably the biggest shock of my life, because inside... There is my knife and a rusty ashtray with a smoldering cigarette in it, meaning that it must have been put in there while we were in the room. And well, at that, we just legged it out straight away. Now, we try to dismiss it as a delinquent playing tricks on us or something, but all of us know that the drawer was rusted shut and that there was a smoldering cigarette in there that must have been put there whilst... We were in that barracks at some point. Hey everyone, I want to tell you guys about an experience that me and my brother shared about two years ago. So, we were deciding to go somewhere hunting during the day and there's a cemetery in Santa Cruz that we wanted to check out. We go in and walk around and nothing out of the ordinary happens, so we decide to leave. The cemetery is on a supposed haunted road that leads up into the woods, and this road is said to be haunted by a lady in white that tries to hitchhike into your car with you. I had forgotten about this fact until after the day. But anyway, along this road that we were driving down, it leads into a forested area, a couple of miles down from the cemetery, you can pull to the side of the road and walk along this hiking trail. 
So we decide to hike this trail because I completely forgot the road was also haunted. So I wasn't even looking for anything paranormal. But we start hiking this trail in the afternoon. Ten minutes into the trail and we stumble along abandoned train tracks and a barely standing bridge for the train that used to run alongside of those tracks. It looks cool, so we decide to go down this hill right by the bridge that lets you go under the dilapidated bridge. We go down there and we just sort of mess around for a bit, looking at the cool architecture and all that. After we had our view, we start back up the hill that leads back to the trail. But when we get to the top, we're a little bit exhausted because the hill is kind of steep, and you have to use the trees around you as sort of leverage to climb back up. So we're just kind of standing around back on the trail when... We both notice something out of the ordinary. We hear a, a voice like a, a grown man shouting and screaming really angrily. And when I say angry, I mean this guy was furious. And what I mean is that the voice sounded like a, a rage-filled, hatefully murderous man taking it out on someone. We quieten down and I can tell the voice is pretty far away. In fact, it almost sounded like it was in the mountains around us. It sounded more than 500 feet away for sure, though. We both just look at each other like, what was that? Well, we stand around listening for like 15 seconds, and the next thing we know, the voice came down the trail from what sounded like hundreds of feet away to being like right down the end of the trail. And I mean, the inhuman speed the voice came closer to us was definitely unnatural. I notice the voice coming from down the trail and I'm thinking to myself, this voice sounds like it's from someone who's about to kill someone out of rage. But the weird thing is that the voice is speaking in what I can only call is like gibberish. I understood not one word it was saying. I instantly get this fight or flight feeling all in my body because this voice starts getting very loud and closer to us at inhuman speeds. I tell my brother to pick up some huge sticks with me to defend ourselves with because even though the voice came out of nowhere and moved down the trail at lightning speeds, I still had the assumption that it was some kind of a crazy person ready to kill someone. We pick up the sticks and then we just run down the trail back to the car as quickly as we can. But here's the weird part. So as we're running away from this voice that's coming down the other end of the trail, I hear the voice come up behind us in like an instant. It sounded like he was no more than 10 feet behind us, I guess, chasing us back to the car. I turn around, even though I don't want to, because I have to see how close this psycho is from us. And as I look back and hear the voice right behind me, I don't see anyone. I tell my brother to run faster, because the voice is right behind us yelling in absolute rage, but I don't see anyone chasing us. We start picking up speed though and the craziest thing in my life happened because the voice starts panning around us in like a 360 audio. What I mean is that I hear the voice yelling in gibberish right behind me, then it starts to pan to my left through the trees just off the trail, then the voice is right in front of us and it slides to the right side of the trail and then back to behind us, all in a matter of at most like 10 seconds. At this point though, me and my brother really creeped out, obviously, and ran the rest of the trail back to the car. The voice kept following us down the trail, and I remember after hearing the voice panning around us and hearing it reverberate through the woods, I started praying to God to help me come out of this one alive, and after we make it around halfway down the trail to my car, the voice just instantly disappears. I remember slowing down exhausted, and we start talking about what we heard. I asked my brother if he also heard the voice slide in circles around us and he said that he heard it too. And at that point I knew that I wasn't hallucinating or imagining it. I asked my brother if he heard how it sounded like gibberish too but sort of like a man screaming at the top of his lungs in rage and he said that he heard the same thing. We finally get into the car and I drive us the heck out of there in a heartbeat. I remember the car ride was silent for like five minutes as we just sort of sat there thinking about what just happened. I think it was at that point too that I remembered that the whole road was allegedly haunted and that not just the cemetery was. I had been down that trail alone a few months before this experience though and I had nothing weird happen, nothing like this anyway. 
This was one of the weirdest things that I've ever experienced in my life though. And to this day, I have never gone back down that trail and I never plan on it either. Everything that I've shared with you guys though, as crazy as it sounds I know, is the absolute truth and I promise you that I haven't altered anything. The Santa Cruz area and the mountains are known for cults and some pretty dark magic being performed in them apparently. And if you guys have any questions about our experience, then please feel free to ask. And also, if you have any ideas about what happened, then I really would love to hear your thoughts.